Welcome to episode 11 of Power Play, where we travel the world to explore the hard truths of the energy transition. This week, we're visiting the Permian Basin and three national parks to explore the past, present, and future of the energy transition taking place in the United States. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, the emergence of fracking and horizontal drilling in the U.S. in about 2007 has had a huge impact on the energy transition. To take a deeper dive into what's happening, we'll start at the Barnett Shale, where George Mitchell's hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling techniques unlocked shale gas. Then we'll head to the Permian Basin, the U.S.'s most prolific oil field. Together, these regions tell a story of triumphs, challenges, and undeniable realities. For decades, coal was king in the U.S. power sector, but its reign was marked by high carbon emissions. Here in Texas, and indeed across the United States, a change was brewing. It's a tale of unintended consequences and serendipity. Fracking didn't just gift us with ultra-cheap natural gas. It came just as the cost of renewables was rapidly falling, and natural gas became the perfect partner to renewables, providing reliability when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Together, natural gas and renewables became cheaper than coal-fired power and caused its rapid retirement. But before we explore the future of the U.S. energy transition, let's revisit roots of this energy saga. We find the toil and triumph of generations of humans and hundreds of millions of years of Earth's geology. As my wife and I drove through Fort Worth and the Barnett Shale, we made a stop at the Museum of Science and History, which has an entire section dedicated to energy with a very strong focus on natural gas production. It tells the story of George Mitchell. Mitchell didn't invent fracking, but over the course of two decades, his company developed it into a groundbreaking way to dramatically improve production from oil and gas wells. Prior to the advent of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling in 2007, U.S. oil and gas production had been declining since 1973, and we were importing record amounts of oil and record amounts of liquefied natural gas. But it was the application of fracking in the Permian Basin, one of the most prolific oil deposits in the world, that really got the party started. So my wife and I continued our trip to Midland, Texas, where we visited the Permian Basin Petroleum Museum. The Permian Basin's location is determined by the Capitan Reef, which formed 260 million years ago by growth and accumulation of invertebrate skeletons of algae, sponges, and tiny colonial animals called bryozoans. Their skeletons were fossilized and stabilized by encrusting organisms that grew over and cemented the solid reef rock. Throughout most of the Permian Basin, the capital reef is buried deep underground. But in some areas, such as the Guadalupe Mountains National Park, tectonic forces have pushed it two miles up and exposed it so that we can see the sedimentary layers in the thousand-foot-high cliff of El Capitan, the most striking feature of Guadalupe Mountains National Park. And in Carlsbad Cavern National Park, the Capitol Reef is very near the surface, and instead of forming oil and gas, it formed the Carlsbad Caverns through acidic erosion of the Capitol Reef limestone. When we take a closer look at El Capitan, what we can see is that on either side of the reef is the back reef and the fore reef. The basin in front of the fore reef is what we're really interested in. It formed as sediments were washed into the basin during the building of the Capitol Reef over millions of years and sloped downwards to depths of nearly half a mile. The sediments that washed into the basin later became thin black limestones. And this black limestone is what contains the organic rich remains of the dead plants and animals that settled to the dark depths of the basin. So though the features at the national parks are beautiful, they reveal geologic processes that exposed rather than buried. Key to understanding why there's no oil and gas at the national parks. But throughout most of the Permian Basin, these oil-rich sediments were buried under the perfect combination of geological processes and environmental conditions over millions of years. So here's how it happened. During the Permian period, the region was characterized by extensive shallow seas and rich organic life. Thick layers of organic-rich sediments accumulated as marine organisms died and settled. The basin itself was slowly subsiding, allowing sediments to continuously accumulate on top of organic-rich layers, burying them under thick overburden. Rapid burial maintained low oxygen conditions, preserving organic materials long enough to transform them into hydrocarbons. 
Over geologic timescales, buried organic materials underwent what's called thermal maturation, transforming first into oil and then into natural gas under increasing heat and pressure. Then, favorable geologic structures like anticlines and fault traps allowed hydrocarbons to migrate and accumulate. And relative tectonic stability in the region has preserved oil and gas traps over millions of years. The oil and gas industry has drilled almost a half a million wells in the Permian over the past hundred years. But the story I want to focus on is in the past 17 years, since the fracking boom that started in 2007. As the industry transitioned from vertical wells a few thousand feet to horizontal wells of tens of thousands of feet, the output per well has skyrocketed. As you can see, these wells are relatively short-lived, with production declining rapidly over a three-year period. The result is that to increase production, new wells need to not only add output, but they also have to make up for the rapid decline from the existing wells. This is a hamster wheel that keeps spinning faster and faster, and it's in a race with rapidly advancing technology. And so far, technology has been winning the race. Although the Permian is the dominant unconventional oil production basin in the United States, its natural gas potential per well isn't nearly as impressive as other U.S. basins. But since this natural gas comes along for free, along with the much more lucrative oil output of a well, the Permian is actually the number two source of U.S. natural gas. An interesting aspect of this is that the Permian is actually producing natural gas at negative prices today and still has favorable well economics due to the lucrative income from oil production. This is also why we didn't have too much trouble finding a natural gas flare while driving through the Permian this week. Our exploration today highlights how geologic fortunes, where and how sediments are buried, can dramatically shape an area's potential as an energy resource. Understanding these natural processes allows us to appreciate the intricate dance between Earth's geological history and our current energy landscape. But just beyond the walls of the Permian Petroleum Museum, the story of this region's future is unfolding. Today, at the Permian Energy Center, solar panels rise from the Earth. And in a stark example of why the energy transition is called a transition, the solar panels were built around the vestiges of oil's past, dozens of oil field pump jacks and their access roads. I mentioned in previous episodes that my wife is an ultramarathon runner, so while driving across the country, we've had to plan time most days for her to run because she's training for an upcoming race. Since today we drove nine hours from Fort Worth to Big Bend National Park, we decided to use our stop at the Permian Energy Center for her to run its length and width to give you a sense of the scale of this project, which contains 420 megawatts of solar panels and 40 megawatts of battery energy storage located on a 3,600 acre site. For my wife to run the entire length and width of the Permian Energy Center was over 10 kilometers or six miles. And solar power and energy storage are only part of the story of the Permian's future. Texas and New Mexico together lead the nation in potential wind capacity and could be thought of as the Permian Basin of Wind. An incredible example of this is Sun Zia's 3 gigawatt plus wind project in New Mexico, which has its own dedicated HVDC transmission line that goes to Arizona. The project just reached financial close and is now under construction. So as dawn breaks over the Permian Basin, it illuminates not just the horizon, but also the dawn of a new chapter. Natural gas once bridged the gap between coal and renewables, but a quiet revolution in energy storage is underway. Lithium-ion batteries have seen their costs plummet and their capabilities soar. They can now store renewable energy for us after the sun sets. And as we discussed in episode 7, green hydrogen is stepping onto the stage for long-duration storage. With water as its source and electricity as its catalyst, it can offer fuel for a future untethered to carbon chains. So let's discuss the first hard truth of this episode. So natural gas, once indispensable, will in the future serve as a bridge. Using affordable storage, we can begin phasing out gas as renewables paired with batteries and green hydrogen supplant it. And as we showed in episode 8, as the exponential growth of electric vehicle unfolds around the world, the oil output of the Permian will also begin to be displaced by renewable power. You know, I've received a number of comments questioning my forecast in episode 8 
that fossil fuel use would peak around 2030 due to the exponential growth of renewables and storage. Well, I have some company in that forecast. Here's the latest forecast from ExxonMobil in their 2023 energy outlook. If we add up the contributions of oil, natural gas, and coal in ExxonMobil's forecast, they actually forecast a fossil fuel usage peak a bit earlier than I did. Exxon's forecast after 2030 obviously has a much longer tail than mine did, but I said in episode 8 that the reality was that exponential growth would eventually give way to an S-curve, and the fall-off wouldn't be as abrupt as what's shown in my figure. But having said that, I do think ExxonMobil is underappreciating how fast EV growth will displace oil demand and how fast energy storage growth will displace natural gas demand. I guess time will tell. And the second hard truth is one that really bothers me sometimes. I often hear people criticizing the oil and gas industry, and I wonder why those people don't acknowledge that the fossil fuel industry and the people who work in it were critical enablers to lifting billions of humans out of extreme poverty during the past 160 years or so. Energy is what powered human productivity during the Industrial Revolution, and productivity is what produced prosperity. Now, I agree that we need the oil and gas companies to come to the party in the energy transition, but we should welcome their help because we're going to need it. And at the same time, leaders in the oil and gas industry need to realize the hard truth that their era of exponential growth in fossil fuels is coming to an end. And they're going to need to embrace the energy transition to grow their businesses and create a future for their employees. Well, that's a wrap on episode 11. So join us next time on Power Play as we continue to navigate the complex energy landscape, exploring the places and innovation that fuel our journey forward. And now as we end this episode, here's some images of the wildlife I saw while exploring the national parks on this trip. Let's go.